Hello and welcome to another edition of The Tigers Down Under. It's our last episode for the season and we're going to be doing a bit of a season recap as well as looking ahead at all of the paper talk, all of the rumours about both players and managers uh, over the coming months. Uh, And with me to dissect it all is Logan. Good evening, Alex, and good evening, everyone. Um, It was a pretty unfortunate way to finish the season it was a pretty dismal performance against Spurs to back up a pretty dismal performance against Crystal Palace so I suppose right off the bat we'll try and cover off that game and spend a little bit of time talking about it but not too much before we can move on to hopefully brighter topics of conversation but uh, it does go down in the record books as our worst ever home defeat in any division um, and it was a pretty unfortunate way to be bundled out of the Premier League but how did you see the game against Spurs? I think whenever you have a game of of that type where the result wasn't really important except for us to kind of save face, uh, particularly for Spurs, they could they could travel up to to Hull on the last day knowing that we didn't have all that much to play for, and either did they really. Um, and it was just one of those uh, kind of the shackles were off performance where they were able to to flex their muscle and show why they uh, finished where they did in the Premier League. And I think that. As soon as uh, we started to get a couple of goals scored against us, you could see that the, the kind of the attitudes of the players were, were pretty bundled down, and uh, yeah, we just we really struggled to to impose ourselves at all. Um, and as I said, the nature of the game almost suggested that that kind of result was was probable, uh, and then it, kind of our reality uh, was confirmed as you saw Tottenham uh, just let loose, and particularly Harry Kane. I went on a rampage. Uh, to the disappointment, I, I did see, though, of uh, the City fans actually clapping him off, which is um, <laughs> always sl- sl- slightly concerning um, yeah, when you've yeah. got the, an opposition striker being cheered from the field uh, when they get replaced early. But um, it is what it is, and yeah, we, we were doomed uh, bef- before the day begun, and the result kind of, the impending result uh, panned out as we expected it to. Uh, the one shining light on the day, I suppose, or at least the, the one mark on the score sheet in our favour was Sam Klukas, and he's he's really been one of the shining lights of the season. I mean, um, you could probably name three players who have really improved their reputation coming out of the season in, abs- in an absolute sense. I'm sure a few others have also bolstered it slightly, but Eldon Yakupovic, Sam Klukas, Harry Maguire have all come out of this season looking like absolute superstars. Um, what have you made of their seasons and, and what have you made of um, the more positive side of, of this season? Yeah, as you mentioned, those three uh, head and shoulders above the rest um, in, in many ways. Although, with, with that being said, I thought that a few of the, the glimpses from the late editions uh, with Nias and Grzycki and Markovic in particular um, gave us a, a much-needed boost. But, yep. yeah, as you mentioned, the, uh, Klukas has probably been the one for me who has uh, proven that he's, the, particularly in the way that he's gone about it, coming through the divisions and then really making his mark in Premier League football. And it's remarkable it's, because coming into the season, I genuinely thought he'd be a bit part player and he'd be sort of um, almost like the David Myler of a few years ago where he'd sort of start off the campaign being in the team but kind of pushed out as we signed better players. And the other aspect that made it remarkable was the fact that when Steve Bruce signed him, we only really saw a lot of him um, out wide yeah. um, or, or kind of covering positions. And when Mike Phelan uh, decided to move him into uh, the central midfield, with that being said, I know that he did play a little bit under Bruce towards the end um, in patches. Uh, we've really just seen a, an incredible ball player. And some of the passing and obviously finishing that we've seen in the last uh, couple of months in particular have just been superb. And I think that it, it would come as a surprise to, to all City fans. I don't think anybody could have predicted the the heights that Sam Klukas has reached uh, this year. And if he is to, to stay at City uh, next season, he will be a, a huge um, a, a, a huge uh, part of our championship campaign. Well, um, I was, I was going to ask you, of the three players, which of them... I mean, obviously, Maguire seems the most likely to move on, but do you see any of the three at City at the start of next season? I, I think Sam Klukas and, and Jakubovic, I think that both of those... Um, will be huge um, additions. Well, I say additions if if we are able to keep them, knowing that uh, there'll certainly be uh, suitors in the market looking for for those caliber of players. But I think it's all, all but uh, as, as sadly as you want to say. I think Harry Maguire will end up going for a hefty price tag. But I think that Klukas and Jakubovic are still uh, two pretty good shouts of of staying uh, staying with City. Absolutely. It'll be interesting to see um, what happens on the player front, but we might start our off-season discussion by discussing 
the managerial departure we've already experienced with Marco Silva heading off to Watford. Um, and then obviously we'll address the, the rumours about the incoming manager in a little bit as well. But just on Silva, what, what did you make of his spell at City? Um, were you disappointed with how it petered out or was that more down to the playing staff? And then what do you see uh, ahead for him at Watford? I, th- I think Silva was a, a breath of fresh air. I think he, he offered hope to a, a campaign that um, that had really none and had no reason to kind of uh, put City in a position to survive Granted, the terrible off-season we had last year, um, the very underwhelming start, although albeit the first two games. And I think that Marco Silva brought some fresh ideas. He brought fresh training methods and obviously uh, the, the players that he signed, I thought, were, were pretty astute additions and, and tried to do their job. Uh, the fact that we came up short probably um, doesn't give us a clear picture of truly just how good Marco Silva is or will be. I'm very interested to see how he will go at Watford, and I don't even want to hazard a guess because I think that under Silva we've seen some incredible football played, but at the same time we have we he, he did fail to address the, the away form uh, yeah. that we were kind of hoping would be the main thing that would, would keep us up. And if we were to get some results on the, the road, would have kept us up. So yeah. I think he's, he's still somewhat of an unknown um, entity. It'll be certainly interesting to see how he goes at Watford, um, especially given their methods at the moment, seemingly of, of sacking a manager every season. Um, I'm not too sure what sort of result they're hoping for from him. Um, I mean, it's important to remember that they finished 17th, so the squad at Watford, or at least the way they played last season, wasn't too inspiring. So uh, I was a little bit surprised when I saw him, him taking the Watford job over the Crystal Palace job that was already available, and also the Southampton job, which I think as of today is now available. Um, I think he would have definitely been up the up the pecking order in both of those clubs' eyes in terms of replacing the outgoing managers. Um, and I think he would have... The, the Palace job in particular, I think, obviously Southampton's a good job as well, but Palace have a pretty terrific squad and, and, and will probably be quite ambitious with, with their targets for next season, whereas I, I get the feeling looking at that Watford squad, he'll... He'll, I mean, he'll certainly have the chance to bring in his own players, which may well be what he's after, but I just don't see the same quality at Watford. So um, it will be a testament to his character if he can, and, and his coaching ability if he can get them into, say, a top 10 position, if he could get them to Europe or if he could get them to, uh, you know, cup semi-final or a final, for instance. Um, it'll, it'll certainly be an interesting one. Yeah, certainly. You know, I am intrigued to see how he does go. I think I'll, I'll somewhat keep one eye on what I... Uh, that the C faithful will do uh, next season, but we do wish him all the best, and um, I, th- I think he, I think he had a really good goal of, of trying to keep us where we, we kind of wanted to be. And then on the playing staff front, with the outgoings, um, we've seen two central defenders um, leave the club in the last few weeks. One only confirmed in the last few hours being Curtis Davies, who's been sold to Derby for reportedly only five hundred thousand, but it, it's an undisclosed fee officially, so we're not, we can't say that with any certainty. Um, and then the other one was Alex Bruce, who was released by the club a couple of weeks ago in the wake of relegation. Um, so I, I guess I'll ask you, first of all, your, your fondest memories of the pair and then uh, what you make of their departures. I think that uh, Curtis Davies obviously was, was one who uh, will always be remembered for his uh, FA Cup goal um, yeah. and, and the way that he celebrated. I think he personified um, the kind of working class city approach and he really did provide uh, stability, particularly when he signed from from Birmingham in the championship and uh, and got given the the captaincy. Um, he he really did lead from the front and will always be remembered for that. I think my favourite me- memory of Alex Bruce was also the FA Cup final. Um, when I I still think that if he stayed on the the field, I think that we probably would have marched on and um and and held the trophy up at the end of the. Um, end of the match, but and, and if, they, his, if his header had been a few inches lower, he, we would have been up three nil as well. That's right. When we <laughs> Gibbs famously cleared it off the line, but yeah. I think that um, Alex Bruce was of the same bracket. He was a, a no nonsense. Um, certainly not the both of them, not the prettiest of players, but uh, they certainly knew how to put a tackle in and uh, provided a, a, lo- a lot of uh, resolve to our, our defence that was um, was incredibly shaky at times um, prior to their arrivals. And I think speaking of tackles, the other abiding memory of Bruce would have been his game against Liverpool, uh, where we won 3-1 and he put in those two huge tackles on, I think, Suarez, and I'm not sure who the other player was. 
to uh, to help clear the ball um, from our half and and just his gusto and the way that he went at the ball, as you say, it was a real workmanlike sort of approach to the game. Uh, and those sorts of players are always appreciated. I, I think he suffered a lot because of his last name, and I think a lot of people even now don't give him the credit he really deserves. But he was, you know, credit to him. He he was a squad player, and he knew he was a squad player, and he, he put his head down, he didn't complain, and when he got his opportunities, he, he played as well as you could expect him to for the price we paid, which he, he was a free transfer, uh, and I suspect he wouldn't have been on, you know, a huge pay packet. He might have been on a on a decent one, but he wasn't on. He wasn't one of our top paid players. Um, and, and for for the role that he played in the team, I thought he did it well. Yeah, totally agree. And I, I will be sad to see him go. I thought that the fact that he was a, a squad player, I still remember the last game of the season uh, when we went down uh, and we we drew with Manchester United. I remember seeing uh, Bruce McShane and I think it my Davies or Dawson at the time. And I remember thinking how resolute our defence looked in a back three. And Alex Bruce certainly, um, although he was a, a squad player in the championship and in the Premier League, uh, he, he really offered um, the, the stability. You never worried when Alex Bruce was on the field. Um, so Davies has been sold. We're, we're suspecting that Maguire might be sold as well. But you suspect we'll be hopefully able to keep hold of Klukas and Jakub, Jakubovic. Who else do you potentially see as being sold from the squad? Uh, I think that Hernandez and Robertson continue to be the ones that... Hernandez seems to be linked with somebody every day and always has been since his arrival at the at the KCOM. So uh, he, he's an interesting one. And I think that the day Hernandez does leave, uh, well, <laughs> it won't come as a surprise because it's almost been um, expectant that he will be departing at some stage. Um, the, it, the fact that he's here now is still a miracle but with that being said we we all know how prolific he can be in the championship and yeah. we'll do very well to to keep him keep him there um and then obviously andy robertson and Maguire, the the two names that continually keep getting leaked um with with, with everybody and seem to carry um a price tag that would suggest uh, that would be almost worth selling um and then with uh, in addition to that would there also be uh, camille Grzicki. yeah it would be interesting as well. Uh, he's sort of a forgotten man now, but Evandro uh, is 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 a permanent signing. He's on our books. He's played with Silver at two previous clubs. Well, um, uh, ourselves and also Sporting Lisbon, I believe. Or was it Essator? Oh, actually, no, it was Essator, wasn't it? Uh, but he's played for, for Silver at two clubs now. Um, so he's someone who potentially Silver might look at bringing to Watford as well. Um, but he's sort of just been forgotten in a lot of discussions that I've seen about players that might leave. And he, in the, in the glimpses that we saw of him in the Premier League, could very well be a very handy player in the Championship. So he's another one where if we could keep hold of him, all of a sudden our midfield, or at least our central midfield, starts to look pretty handy. Um, and it might just be a case of bringing in a couple of, of, a couple of wide players, you know, a, a, another striker or two, and a couple of central defenders, obviously, and, and then we might actually be in okay shape. Yeah, certainly. And it would be interesting to see. The one question mark that I would have over Evandro is I think that he does have a career that suggests that he's somewhat injury prone. Yes. Uh, and yeah. his, his time at City did nothing to, <laughs> to change that. Um, whether he could cop the, the extra games in the championship and um, provide that kind of stability over long periods of time, I'm not so sure. But uh, certainly a, a handy asset, uh, and particularly for the small price tag that he carries. Absolutely. Um on the incomings front, uh, we can start with the manager, who's the one who we have some sort of concrete information about. And it, and it looks, by all reports, that Leonid Slutsky, I think is how you would pronounce it. I'm not too good with my Russian pronunciations. But he seems to be on his way in pending a work permit, so that's potentially being announced next week. And the other interesting piece of information in that is the fact that the club's looking to appoint a director of football, which promises to be quite a handy addition depending on the scope of the role because it sounds as if the club's sort of looking to shake up the entire footballing department. Ehab wants to take a step back from dealing with transfers, which I think everyone, including him, probably thinks is a good idea given, you know, last summer our transfer business was done so late. There's been criticisms over negotiations over prices, um, whether the director of football would have specific targets or ways to shape the squad that might be better than the club has at the moment. Um, whether the scouting network improves, etc. There's there's plenty of ways that this could be a really good move by the club. Um, and obviously, if Slutsky's keen to come regardless of this move, that sounds like that can be a good thing. 
Um, and then, obviously, the silver lining of, of losing these players, obviously, Davies not for a whole lot of money, but Maguire being touted as going for about 20 million, Robertson, who knows, maybe 10, 12 million. It's going to be a lot of money for the new manager to spend and really shape the squad the way he wants. So, what, what do you make of the news about the, the potential managerial signing and, and what that could mean for the, the squad uh, heading into the new season? I think the first thing to, to take note of and to not get so carried away with is the fact that, yes, um, as you mentioned, we have recouped quite a lot of money. But with that being said, we don't always have uh, uh, much predictability when it comes to, to dealing with the alums. And we do wonder how much of that will be reinvested in players, um, how much will be used to, to pay off that uh, illustrious debt that they are so willing to talk about when when the going gets tough. So we don't really know just how much will um, will kind of be put into our hands uh, to, to for the purpose of purchasing players. So I think that's the first thing that we we need to consider. Um, all of the kind of leaks that we we're getting with managers until anything is signed. Um, although, as you mentioned before, the the press certainly do suggest that the the Russian uh, Slutsky, uh is is very likely um, on his way. Um, it can only be a good thing. Obviously, there's some changes in the background um, and the fact that we do have to deal with the, the relegation and going back to the championship. Um, the, the type of football we, we play and the, the kind of um, style that the, the manager hopes to, uh, to kind of set will certainly um, have a bearing on what type of players we go out and sign, uh, whether we do go into the loan market, um, whether they're permanents uh, and, and, of course, the, the way the manager actually plays. It's, it's going to be a very interesting couple of months. And in this period of speculation, we can only kind of do exactly that um, until it gets closer to the, to the season. Um, uh, we're, it's somewhat still relatively unknown. Um, it, it would be great to see the Slutsky get appointed early and signings happen early, but um, as we've seen in the, in the past, that, that has not been the case case and regardless of what the alums say until signings start taking place um i'm not too sure um what what to read into and what not to yeah i mean i suppose from my point of view i try and look at it with a glass half full and i think i said similar on the last podcast at least in the championship it feels as if the alums in the last three seasons or the last two seasons that we've spent in the championship under the alums we've certainly they, they've certainly invested in a way that has shown intent to get promotion. And I think at least from that point of view, we can look at it and say, well, for once, the supporters, the owners, everyone is sort of one-minded in terms of their motivation, and that's to get out of this league as quickly as possible. Because from the Alum's point of view, they can only be costing them money the longer we stay outside the Premier League. Uh, you can say what you want about their dealings in the Premier League, because obviously once we're there, they're quite happy just to pocket cash or service the loan or what have you. But I think at least in the Championship, um, I would hope at least, and this is me being optimistic, that they will also be quite keen to, to see us promoted as soon as possible. Um, and the other point I found quite um, optimistic was Ehab saying that our budget is going to be similar to what it was the last time we, we earned promotion under Bruce. Um, and I'm hoping what he means by that is not so much saying, oh, well, you know, we spent, say, £20 million pounds last, set, last time, so we'll have £20 million pounds to spend this time, because, of course, this time we've got a lot more holes to fill in the squad. I'm hoping what it means is that our net spend will be of a similar amount. So, for instance, if we're selling Maguire for £20 million, all of a sudden we can say, OK, well, let's reinvest, say, £5 million of that into a new centre-back or £6 million of that into a new centre-back. It still leaves us, you know... 10, 12, 14 million pounds to spend on a new striker or a new left back or, um, you know, a, a right wing or, or something like that. So I'm hoping that that's more the way they're going to approach it. Obviously, as you say, it remains to be seen and we, we won't know for certain until the 1st of September when the window closes. But um, it's, it's going to be an interesting few months, I suspect, as a city supporter. And the first, hopefully, good signs will be when the manager's appointed. And then I guess we, uh, we all strap in for the wild ride from there. Yeah, um, I think I think the other thing worth mentioning as well is uh, that the, in the search for looking for a new manager, they would the Alums would need to present um, a picture of them having some control in, in the sense that the new manager, once they take over, um, they can come in and and run the football club the way they would like to run the football club. So the package needs to be um, enticing to a degree, um, particularly because it's no longer a Premier League position, it's a championship position. So there is uh, somewhat a risk 
from an international manager to come across. And then if they were to fail in the championship, uh, that's certainly not a good uh, record to have on their CV. So, look, we wait and see. Um, I do hope that uh, the, the, the change in the Alum administration now is finally the line in the sand. And if there is an opportunity for them to earn the trust of the fans back, now is certainly it. Uh, but part of me uh, remains very sceptical. Uh, yeah, it'll certainly be interesting. I mean, I did find it positive and interesting to note that Sotsky did say in an interview that he sort of recognises that in England the game sort of works a bit differently. And despite the fact that he's won the Russian Premier League, despite the fact he's managed in the Champions League, you sort of have to, <laughs> so to speak, earn your stripes to quote a certain ill-fated uh, um, marketing campaign but he, he, he may well have to earn his reputation in the championship before getting a go in the Premier League and I found that interesting to hear from him and, and certainly is potentially a positive sign that he, he's quite willing to, to manage in the championship and see how he goes with us before um, chancing his hand in the Premier League and, and of course the other thing being his, his close friendship with Abramovich at Chelsea and, and whether that has any positive um, repercussions if he is to become our manager uh, in the way of loan players from Chelsea and, and whether the the club can sort of take advantage of that relationship a little bit. Yeah, um, we, can, we can only hope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll move on now. And, and we, we put it out to the Facebook group just a little while ago that uh, we were accepting a few questions from people. Um, ahead of this podcast, and we, I thought we'd delve into some of those now um, in a little bit of a segment. And and the first question I'll start with, which I've I've always found quite an interesting question to to ponder, is from Damien Tingle, which was whether we'd prefer to bounce straight back up next season or potentially spend a few seasons back in the championship trying to rebuild. Um, and I find this an interesting one because it is sort of a point that that people sometimes debate um, as football clubs whether or not it's best to go up as as champions, as Leicester did, with over 100 points, with a really solid, really good squad, uh, really sort of dominate the division, as Newcastle did as well, and really give yourself that platform to, to maintain your position in the Premier League, or as a relegated club, whether it's best to just try and get back up as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm definitely of the belief that uh, the quicker you get back up to the Premier League, the better chance you are of, of rebuilding. I think the biggest challenge for you comes once you do get promoted is staying in that first year. I think once you uh, build your kind of uh, your foundations up in the Premier League, it's much easier to stay there um, because of the amount of changes that do happen for a promoted side, um, and particularly for one of a club of our size. I do, however, feel that... Um, if we were to go up next season and, and did bounce up again, which we're all hoping, um, with the likes of Bowen and uh, Josh Tymon and even Moses Otabajo, um, if we were to hold on to Harry Maguire and Robertson miraculously, we do have an incredibly young squad still um, with guys that I think could be um, tried and tested at Premier League level and, and do a job for us. Um, which would kind of mention the fact that we, uh, we would be um, a strong club um, and would be kind of stable. In the, in the top flight, you would hope. Absolutely. Um, and then sort of following on from that, in a way, um, Scott Daniels had a question in relation to potential buyers of the club, and he asks whether or not we'd be more appealing to buyers now that we're in the championship because of the fact that the club may well be cheaper, um, or, or whether the fact that there's a lack of Premier League football that might actually put buyers off. Yeah, um, I think that the the kind of the advertising that uh, that comes with uh, with a Premier League club um, certainly does um, provide that attractive uh, potential for uh, for big money and and kind of sponsorship opportunity. But I, I guess there is probably a, a lot of an element in uh, in what the the question's asking is the fact that if you do pick up one of the top end Championship clubs and they do get promoted. Um, you obviously have put money in at a, at a much lower um, lower price, and then you may reach a, um, a kind of a bigger dividend based on the fact that you picked up a, a kind of a cheap, good good club um, in this in the sense that they bounce back up, and you know we know what comes with the spoils of uh, promotion and the the f financial windfall. Absolutely, and I suppose in a way, uh, our friends, at the new owners of Reading, had hoped that that was going to be the case when they bought that club, making the championship playoff final and, and hopefully seeing them straight up into the Premier League would have been a much cheaper way of getting a Premier League club than I suspect would have cost them if they had ended up buying us at the start of the season. So um, 
it's an interesting one, and I think it's a strategy we're seeing a bit more often now because you look at Wolves as well were bought this season. I think Leeds have changed hands in their ownership as well. Um, so I think there's a few clubs now that are sort of coming under this this scrutiny where they're the bigger clubs but sitting in the in the uh, championship. I think Nottingham Forest is another example um, where owners are potentially looking at clubs in the championship with a lot of untapped potential. Uh, and in a way, I feel like we're one of those clubs. There's a lot of potential in the club, whether that's off the off the field in terms of um, engaging with supporters and, and, and racking up a few more thousand or million pounds in, in terms of me- uh, uh, season tickets or merchandise or any sort of other op- opportunities off the field, um, as well as just the huge catchment area the club has. I mean, we're a club that essentially, you compare it to any London London club, and, and we've got such a huge catchment area in terms of potential supporters, potential youth players, um, and, and all of that, that we just don't seem to be tapping into. I mean, I think probably the closest club comparably in, a, in terms of... Um, league stature at least was is Leeds and they're and they're not very close to Hull at all really in the scheme of things um I might need a geography lesson if I'm getting that wrong but I suspect that's the case and and there just seems to be a whole lot of untapped potential in a lot of factors at the club that that new owners could really find quite attractive and the other thing that I would also add to that is the fact that City have proven their resilience over the last few few years with their bounce back ability if you will um, in the fact that we have been promoted in, in short succession um, a couple of times. So, um, al- al- albeit with Steve Bruce at the reign, uh, it does kind of show that there's there's potential for that to, to happen uh, yet again. Uh, and here's an interesting question that we'll finish off on. We've sort of touched on this topic already, but it, it ends with an interesting um, challenge for us, which I might struggle with. So I'll see how you go as well. But it's from Peter Johnson, um, our friend over at Tigerlink. And he, he's asking which players we think will stay and following that, what do we think the starting eleven for the first day of the season next season could look like from existing players? Um, a, a very loaded question and, and a very good one. Um, I would have said uh, a few hours ago that Curtis Davies would have almost been one of the first names <laughs> on the team sheet until, until he moved. So I think um, the kind of unpredictability with this answer... Um, it, it, it will be based on obviously what happens between now and and September uh, or August rather. Um, I, I think that will Michael Dawson will will hopefully still be there. Um, with the prediction that <laughs> Andy Robertson will leave, um, Jakubovic will stay. Uh, Motors Otto Badger won't be back from injury. Uh, whether Elmo will be there. Look, I, I I don't even think I can hazard a guess to at to what yeah. it will look. It's tough, isn't um, it? Because I mean, and, I, I don't even think we'll have. We, we, at the moment, we'll have, we've obviously got Maguire and Dawson both as centre backs on the books, but Maguire's obviously going to be leaving the club. So I think we don't even have two centre backs to try and fit an eleven together. Can we can we take a rain check for for Pete and we wait for the next podcast to, <laughs> yeah, to add, might... answer this one properly, and we'll we'll have a look at uh, what some of the transfer window dealings with uh, between now and then, and uh, we'll we'll answer that question next time. I think the only area of the pitch where I'd almost be able to hazard a guess at, at, at our starting side would be the midfield, and that would only be because I suspect we'd be able to fit Klukas, Huddleston, Mylar, and Evandro across a, across a four, but even then I'm not sure how Evandro would go out wide on the right. Whether we'd keep Grzycki and put him out on the left, and yeah, I, I don't know, it's hard to find a balance there. Unless we played it as a three-five-two, but then <laughs> you're looking at a fair few centre backs needing to come through the doors to manage that. So it's it's a really interesting question, and there might well be one that we can uh, give a better answer to uh, at the start of the preseason when we next do our podcast, or, or sh- I should say, a couple of weeks before the season begins when we next do our podcast. Um, but just before we before we go, just to round things up, um, I thought we could finish off by discussing the fact that as of next season obviously we're back in the championship last time we were in the championship we were doing a podcast every month uh, between televised games obviously now with the brilliant introduction of iFollow we'll be able to watch games every week and therefore um, commentate or or discuss them on the podcast so it will remain a weekly podcast Uh, and also the fact that uh, as I just mentioned we'll, we'll be back probably a week or two before the season begins pending any huge news obviously if we have um, a large bulk of transfer activity uh, anything sort of controversial or, or something that we really th- feel is is newsworthy we'll probably try and do a special podcast at that point um, 
But apart from that, I thought I'd get your closing thoughts on where you see us finishing next season. Do you see us uh, finishing top six, top two, uh, or do you think at this stage it's just genuinely too hard to guess because of all of these unknown factors? Uh, as you mentioned, there's a, a huge amount of unknown, as there always is with any relegated team moving back to uh, back to the championship. I, I think we'll I think we'll be in the six. I don't know whereabouts. I'd, I'd be surprised if we if we missed out on on a playoffs berth. Uh, but I think given the quality that we've got on the books and the financial windfall that we hope to be able to reinvest, I think that we're very capable of, of building a squad that should certainly uh, be there or thereabouts um, around the promotion time a- again, whether that be through the automatic spots or through the six, I'm not so sure. But um, I'm going to say, uh, uh, whilst I say that I'm unsure, I'm going to go with a wild guess and say fourth. Yeah, uh, I... I... My optimism does suggest that I, I can't see us slipping too far from the playoff places. I suspect we'll be there or thereabouts. Whether we're fighting for the top two, I think, is really going to depend on, A, the players that we bring in, and B, really how the squad gels together and, and responds to whoever the new manager is, assuming it's Slutsky. Because um, it, it's going to be an interesting one, because regardless of what happens in terms of the managerial changes, um, almost half or three quarters of the squad is getting turned over, and it's a huge amount of instability over the last 18 months, even in terms of the squad, because obviously last summer we lost a few players. And then in January, we also lost another few players as well as bringing in all the loans. And even though those loans are now gone, their place in the team has sort of uh, influenced the way the other players have played and become used to them. And it's now, it's now a change to get used to not having them there again. So it's certainly going to be interesting to see how we adapt to life back in the championship and, and, who we can hold on to will really dictate, I think, how the season begins and how we go. Because if we can hold on to, for instance, Krzyzewski, Klukas, um, and a few other players of that sort, even Hernandez potentially, um, at least it gives us a bit more consistency and continuity and, and may well give us a, a decent start to the season, which at the end of the day may well be the difference between a promotion place and not. And the other thing that is certainly worth noting as well is the fact that clubs of the size of Sunderland and Middlesbrough are back down there um, that will, will cause huge problems. Um, it's not anything for granted, certainly, that, that we will be able to fight. And Aston Villa are a team that scares me um, just based on the fact that we know Steve Bruce so well. Uh, they've obviously got the financial backing from their owner uh, and I think that that will be a, certainly a team to watch. Absolutely, and I think that's going to be one of the first dates penciled in the diary will be that reunion with Steve Bruce, and and, um, it'll certainly be an interesting game, uh, no doubt. And um, We've got the fixtures coming out in just exactly two weeks from now on the 21st of June, so that'll certainly be one to look forward to. Um, Probably this may well answer that question, but as a final question, what team would you want to see us playing on the first day of the season? Um, I think uh, an opening opening day date with Leeds would be uh, would be pretty special um, for for the Tiger Nation. But I think that we'll end up playing someone uh, around like the Fulham stature or a, some a, a tough away trip to London or something like that. Be underwhelming. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks for coming on, Logan, and uh, I'm sure we'll be speaking again before too long. Yeah, not a problem. Sounds good. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Um, Until next time, there's no football to to watch, but hopefully the club can get some deals done and and start to see some new faces in the building rather than just seeing some old faces leaving the building. So until next time, have a good summer or winter, depending on what side of the world you're on, and we'll see you back here in, in time for the start of next season. Until next time, come on, City. You've been listening to the official Hull City Australia podcast. For more discussion, join us on Facebook in the Hull City AFC Australian Supporters Group or follow us on Twitter at Hull City AFC Oz. The music was created by Amber and Black.